supposed to be right here, so I'll hold it right here. Let's open in a word of prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we're so, so honored, Lord, and thankful to be here in your presence this morning, Lord, to be here in your house as your body is your bride, Lord God. We pray that as we come together in unity, Lord God, to submit ourselves to you, to worship your holy name, and to, Lord, just bask in the glory of your holy presence and spirit here today, Lord. We just pray that you bless us with showers, showers of your living spirit all over us this morning, within us, throughout us, Lord God, that you saturate this place this morning with your Holy Spirit. We ask in your name, Jesus. Amen. Let's welcome the Lord. Lord God, we welcome you into this house, Father. And we want, Lord God, so much to feel your holy presence, Father. We want to experience your presence, Lord. We want to lavish you with our love, Lord God, and our attention and our focus today. I pray, God, you set your warring angels guard around us, Lord God, that you would protect us, Lord God, as we worship you, Lord God. And I pray, Lord, that your perfect will be accomplished in our house today, Lord. I pray that we bless you, Father, and that you be, um, be blessed by our praise, Father. At your name, thank you, Jesus. shake and crumble at your name the oceans roar and tumble at your name angels will bow the earth will rejoice your people cry Shut 
your name filling up the skies with endless praise endless praise your way your way we love to shout your name
thank you, Lord God, that you, Lord God, renew things, Lord God. You make a new life, Lord God. You redeem life, Lord God. You redeem circumstances, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for newness, Lord God, in our hearts, in our lives, in our spirits, in our situations, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You never leave us orphaned or abandoned, Lord God. We are with us, Lord God, even to the end of the age. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord God. We honor you, Jesus. We honor you today. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord.
praise your mighty name, Lord. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Holy are you, Lord God. Praise your name, Lord Jesus. Praise your mighty name, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We praise your name, Lord. We praise you. We praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise your name. Thank you, Lord. Have your way, Lord. Have your way. Have your way. Shut up! 
If you need a touch from the Lord this morning, whether physical, spiritual, emotional, financial, it doesn't matter what it is, he's here. And I ask you to come forward and we'll lay hands upon you and pray in Jesus' name for the Spirit of God to work miracles in your life. I mean this with all my heart. We can hear the word, but we have to act upon it. We have to move into it, and we have to wait upon him. If you have a need this morning, I invite you to come forward, and we will lay hands upon you. And as you pray, I pray that you would remember Sister Watson. She was just rushed to the hospital, collapsing in her house, and I just ask you to remember her in prayer. Lord, reach your hand. Reach your hand, O oh God, to her. Lord, I pray that you would make it all easy. Let her know that you're there with her, Lord. Let her know that you have her in the palm of your hand in Jesus' name. And I ask for those that want to come forth to do so now. I'm going to do something different this morning. Something off the script. I have one. And I'm going to refer to it. But I want to tell you a couple of things that I believe the Lord has directed me to do in the last few minutes, actually. In the book of Psalm, chapter 42, very, very familiar portion of Scripture, the first three verses say, as the heart or the deer pants after the water brook, so pants my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat or my food day and night. My tears replace the food that I would eat while they continually say unto me, where is thy God? Have you wonder, wondered where God is at times? David wrote this psalm to give to the three sons of Korath. They were workers in the, in the temple. They were Levites. And they were in a bad way because their father had turned his back on God and was doing wickedness in, in front of them. And they were so despondent and hurt and torn up by this. And David wrote this psalm for them to be sung at a time when their heart was crying out. Or to when they would go to the temple and teach and preach and they would 
They would sing this song as a special song to uplift the souls of the people. The significance of verse 2 says that the fierceness of the thirst of a deer is profoundly different than that of most animals. Most animals do require water, of course, but deer will literally cry tears for thirst. They can't be without the water. David said in verse 4, When I remember these things, I pour my soul out in me. For I had gone with the multitude, and I had seen them before the throne of God, in the, in the house of God, rejoicing with great joy and exuberance. One time that was me, David is saying. But now my soul says, Why are you cast down? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope thou in God. On the one hand, David's soul is saying, I'm so despondent and I'm so downcast. On the other hand, he's talking to that soul and saying, Oh soul, hope in God, for you know that's where you will find your help in his countenance. Oh God, my God, my soul is cast down with me within me, but I remember the land of Jordan and what you did there. And I remember in the Mount Hermon what you did there and in the hill of Mizar. And David's saying, I can't and I won't be satisfied until I find that place in thee once again. A writer named Burns said these words, after God's Holy Spirit has once touched a soul, it will never be quiet again until it stands pointed Godward. So David compares his despair and he looks at verse 7 and he said, The deep calls unto the deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and all the billows have gone over me. I read that in the Mediterranean region, the water spouts over the Mediterranean Sea are enormous and they drop copious amounts of rain upon that dry and arid terrain. And when that happens, those water spouts will erode and wash away that terrain. And David's saying, my soul is like that. It's being washed away by these billows. Verse 8, yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime. And in the night his song shall be with me. And my prayer will be unto the God of my life. And I will say unto God my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As a sword in my bones, my enemies reproach me, while they say daily unto me, Where is thy God? In the 1600s, the country of France had a revolution. And this was a political revolution, but it was definitely a spiritual one. For the Catholic Church set about to wipe out the Protestants in the country. And I read that the, the country was uh, being governed by the leadership of the Catholic Church. And the Huguenots were the Protestant movement that was trying to gain independence from the Catholic Church. And I read that on one day alone, more than 20,000 Protestants were murdered in cold blood by the ruthless Catholic leadership that wanted control of the country. And during these killings and these rampages of churches and homes and businesses that they were trying to extinguish, these Protestant believers, 
they heard the Catholics chanting, and where is your God now? Verse 11 gives us a portion of the answer to this. Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. Or said this way, I will earnestly contend with him. I will lay my case open to him as a friend. And when my flesh suggests to me that he has forgotten me, my faith will hold its own fastened to the rock of ages. Amen? Fastened to the rock of ages. In chapter 73, I'm only going to read one verse there. This whole chapter is very similar to chapter 42 that we just read those first 11 verses. And when he was struggling to figure this all out, he couldn't understand why the wicked prospered and why it seemed that he was chastised all the day long, being uh, pursued by Saul and Absalom, trying to kill him, his own son, David says. I thought to know these things, but it was too painful for me to know. Verse 17, will you look at uh, 73, chapter 73 and verse 17. Oh, praise the Lord. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. I don't have to worry about those things because God has it well in control. But it wasn't until I entered into that sanctuary, both the physical temple building and that spiritual sanctuary that we go to as believers in Christ. It is our refuge. It is the place we go for hiding in him. Whether it seems that we're being pursued by an enemy or it seems that we're just parched and dry like that deer, it's when we go into that sanctuary that we find our refuge. Psalm 77 says, uh, verse 13 and 14, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary who is so great a God as our God? Thou art the God that doest wonders. Thou hast declared thy strength among the people. And with thine arm, thy strong arm, thou hast redeemed thy people. I want to say that the, second, the book of Second Chronicles 16.9 says that the eyes of the Lord are running to and fro across the earth, looking for those who have stood strong because he wants to show himself strong to those whose heart is perfect after him. Amen. He preserved the remnant of Israel. He preserved the remnant of the Protestants, and he will preserve us. In the name of the Lord, I want to tell a very brief rendition, if I can. I won't hold you very long. And I've told this before, so if it's too, too soon, please forgive me. When Jim and I were contemplating what to do, it was 1981, and he was in construction work, and there were no jobs. It was just here in this area. There, was, there were just no jobs. And my mom had gone on an uh, exploration trip to Texas the year before, and her and my Aunt Jeanette and Terry and uh, maybe Christy's mom, I can't remember if she went with them, and scouted out the land near Austin, Texas, and found a place that they thought would be beautiful for us to move to. And 22 of my family members sold their houses here 
and moved to Texas. We lived at the time, actually I got that out of order. Erase that for just a minute because we had to go first. <laughs> the, night that, the night before we were to leave, Jim and I were laying in bed. We had two small kids. Doug was about three, and Don was about six months. And Jim said, Debbie, I can't go and leave you here. For he was to go that next morning and help Jan and Matt move two babies under one year old. They had, no, two babies, how did they do it? <laughs> I don't remember. Their two children are only about uh, 10 months apart. So yeah, that's two babies in a year. And they couldn't make the trip by themselves because they had two vehicles to drive. And, and one of them couldn't be responsible for an infant and the other for the little tiny 18-month-old. Darren was 18 months old and Lori was about six months old when we moved. So Jim told Matt, I will go with you. I'll drive the vehicle. You take care of one or both of the kids and, and then I'll fly home. And I was going to stay at home. No, Doug was in kindergarten, so he was about five. And Jim said, I can't go and leave you here. My heart isn't at peace. I can't sleep. I can't think about this. You've got to come with me. And you remember I said in that story, I told him, I can't go because I've got dirty laundry. I can't, I can't leave dirty laundry. And Doug's in school. What will we do with him? And he said, let's get up, do the laundry, pack the car, and we'll leave in the morning and we'll figure it out as we go. That was on, I believe, a Tuesday morning. And we didn't come back for seven years. God knows where you are. He knows what's ahead. And he knows how to get you where you need to be. To be in that blessing. When we got to Texas, first of all, let me tell you this. If you've never been to Texas, it's big and it's hot. So we got to the border of Texas and whatever's on this side of, of Texas just before El Paso and all of that. And we thought, finally, we're here. I, I believe we drove for three or four straight days with all these little children with us. And we thought, finally, we are here. Well, little did we know that where we were going was almost 600 miles from the border when we got in to Texas. So we had a whole nother day of travel to get there. The day after we arrived, Matt didn't have a job because the job he was promised fell through on the road to get there. The guy called him and said, I'm sorry, I can't hire you. And Matt said, I've got a, a roofing truck be pulling behind me. You have to hire me. He said, I'm sorry, my work has fallen apart and I can't hire you. So here are the two men and Jan and I and four babies between us get there with no job. The next morning, I'm not kidding you, the next morning, Matt and Jim got in the truck and they drove to the first job site they came to and they stopped and walked up to the, what appeared to be the foreman or the general contractor, whatever he was, and introduced themselves. Now, you that know us know that Jim was not a roofer, he was a carpenter. And Matt's father had the roofing company that he gave to Matt. Matt had been roofing since he was a little child. And this man turned to Jim and stuck his hand out and said, well, I can see that you are a roofer bar none. And to Matt, nice to meet you. 
And the guys just laughed and said, yes, can we start tomorrow morning? And he said, yes. And they worked and worked and worked till the economy fell apart in Texas. And we left there seven years later. I told you that because God knows the heart that follows after him. And he will not leave you in a place that you can't be in or that you shouldn't be there. I want to tell you one more quick story and then we're going to take communion. And I've also mentioned this before, but I I absolutely feel the Lord put this on my heart. When we were little girls, we would often spend the Saturday nights with one or the other of our grandparents. My grandma Nail, who lived here in Campbell, she didn't, her husband had left and he wasn't around. And, but Grandma Wilbanks and Grandpa Wilbanks lived in Campbell also. Grandma Nail attended church here and Grandma Wilbanks and he attended Camp, uh, Campbell Baptist Church about a stone's throw away from here. And we would spend the night on Saturday nights And if we spent the night with Grandma Nail, of course, we automatically came here because this was her church. And we walked from there to here to get here. We loved it. But if we spent the night with Grandma and Grandpa Wilbanks, they went to a different church. And once in a while, and I mean once in a while, Mama would let us go to church with Grandma Wilbanks to the Campbell Baptist Church But once I started playing the piano, that was over with because she wouldn't have it. She wouldn't let me be gone on Sunday morning, so that ended that. But Grandma's Church sang a song, the same song, every single service. Every service closed with this song. It was written long ago by a, name, a man named Thomas Ken. And he was orphaned in childhood and he was raised by his sister and her husband, Isaac Walton. Are there any fishermen in the house? No. He wrote a classic, iconic book on fishing called The Complete Angler. In 1651, Ken became a scholar at Winchester College, a Presbyterian school, and he received his Bachelor of Arts degree there. So he began writing hymns for the students at Winchester College, and they would sing them in the Winchester Cathedral. There, through his preaching and music, he uplifted the students' hearts and blessed the congregation. So in 1674, Ken published a manual of prayers for the use of the scholars of Winchester College. That's quite a mouthful for a book of prayers, isn't it? The words to these hymns were published as an appendix, and the doxology as we sing it today became the closing stanza of each of three separate hymns that he wrote, and the world gained an instrument of praise that has been priceless through the years. I read that the original song had 14 stanzas. I'm going to read you the first, the ninth, and the last, which we sing as the doxology, and then we're going to take our communion. The first is awake my soul and with the sun thy daily stage of duty run. Shake off dull sloth and joyfully rise to pay thy morning sacrifice. All praise to thee who safe has kept and has refreshed me whilst I slept. Grant, Lord, when I from death shall wake, I may of endless light partake. And the stanza that you all know as we know, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father 
Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Grandma's Church sang this every time I was ever there. And one time, I don't remember how old I was. I must have been 13, 14. Their pianist had to leave early, and they asked me to play this song. I'm sure I butchered it, because I didn't know the song. We didn't sing it here, and I didn't know it. But I did the best I could, and the song has meant something to me for all these years. We read in chapter 42, verse 11, as David said, even when it feels like a sword is piercing my bones, or I'm dying of thirst, yet I will praise him. I will look into the sanctuary, the physical and the spiritual, and my faith will hold to the rock of ages. If you would pass out the communion elements, please. I don't know why I felt compelled to tell you the story of us moving to Texas, how that Jim and Matt got that job so uncanny because, as I said, Jim had never roofed. It was Matt who was the roofer, but God provided the need. And I went to work about a week later for IBM, and Jan took care of the kids. We enrolled Doug in school. We all shared a house until we bought our house uh, about six or eight months later. And when we were on the road coming, going to Texas, Jim asked me to look up churches in, in Austin area. And I read him off the streets and, you know, about whatever there was to say about them. And we found this church in Austin. We lived in Round Rock, and Austin was 17 miles north. Austin was 17 miles north of Round Rock, so we had a little ways to drive if we were going to go into Austin to church. And as we were driving, he said, read that one again. And I read it again, and it was Trinity Chapel. And we went there for the whole seven years that we lived there. And God was so real and blessed so beautifully. Will you stand with me? Let's take this communion. Has everyone been served? Almost. I know this has been a little different this morning, but God has been here and he's visited us and I believe he's blessed us. Don, would you pray over the bread, please? Do you want this? Mighty God, we are so thankful, and we are so grateful, and we are so honored and blessed today, Lord Jesus, to be in your house and to be so moved by your Holy Spirit this morning. And as we, Lord, take part in this communion in remembrance of what you've done for us and looking forward to the future and what you have in store for us, we are so humbled, Lord God, by, what you, by, by your sacrifice, Lord, on the cross and your body that was broken and wounded and destroyed utterly, Lord Jesus, for our blessing, for our benefit, Lord God, that we may have eternal life. And we just give you honor, praise, and glory, Lord Jesus, as we take this bread in remembrance of your body that was broken upon Calvary for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Doug, would you pray over the cup? You can come and or talk really loud. Amen. Let us take. Father, we thank you that no matter what, our faith holds to you the rock of ages. 
That when our heart is thirsty and dry and parched, Lord, we can enter into that sanctuary, that sanctuary of love and prayer, O oh God, that we feel you so strongly as we did here this morning. God is moving by his spirit. Move, O oh Lord, in me. It is my prayer, and I know it is yours as well. Father, we ask that you would go with each one. Your covering, O oh God, goes with us. We do not walk out from under it, but we stay in that sheltered place. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings. Thank you for your word this morning that assures us, Lord, our soul can cry out to you and you hear our cries. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen.